the silent intelligence. Okay, my name is Richard Brennan. I'm the Marcom Chair for an international standards organization called 1M2M. Tell me about 1M2M. So 1M2M is a partnership formed by seven of the original partners that also formed 3GPP. Okay. But with the addition of additional partners like TIA, where I'm a member through the United States, um, and we just added TSDSI, the standards group that just emerged in India. Okay. So we've now got global coverage, China, Korea, Japan, United States, Europe, and India. Got it. Um, there's been a lot of talk today about standards. Um, where, and, and there's a lot of acronyms, a lot of names, and uh, tell me, where are the pain points? I mean step back just a little bit and where where are companies experiencing pain where if a standards or a group could step forward first would it make the most difference so we have a, a near term and a long term issue okay. here in the near term people are trying to decide on what the networking protocol looks like what sure. the device characteristics are um, how to get started in the market in the long term the questions are a little bit different how would you scale that to millions? How would right. you get to one of those billions numbers right. that the analysts are so fond of? We address the second question more directly, which mm -hmm. is how do you scale many orders of magnitude globally? Mm -hmm. And we do that by not focusing on the network and device layer, but focusing one layer above that, below the cloud okay. and application, mm -hmm. but above the networking and device. So you could call it a middleware layer, okay. we call it a services layer, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and this allows us to federate many types of networks, many types of providers, mm -hmm. and do that across a global economy. I want to ask you about that. I want to ask you about the middleware layer. But let's talk about the edges first, just so we know where the edges are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in just traditional TCP IP, the ordinary stack that everybody saw when they were in Computer Science 101, where does that end and where do not just your organizations, but IoT's needs begin? Well, so we're all relying on one flavor or the other mm -hmm. of IP communications to do this enablement. Mm -hmm. So but that's even a, IP. You got IP four, IP I six. I understand. Yeah. There's so many more these are yeah. um, our, our um, the CCSA from China okay. is adamant that they want IPv six okay. deployed first. They they don't want to start with four and then migrate. They want to start with IPv six. Mm -hmm. Other places are saying, well, we have already a, an embedded Legacy. base of, of v four exactly, and so we need to do a transition. But given that you need the address space, mm -hmm. um, we see that this is going to accelerate, mm -hmm. finally, I could say, mm -hmm. uh, the, the trend to, towards going to V6. Okay. What we have also is, is the exact nature of your IP communications is probably most relevant mm -hmm. the further out to the distant corners of the edge you go. Right. This is where um, Low, uh, low pan and all these new IP variants okay. play really well to allow low power, mm -hmm. uh, low throughput right. versions of IP to exist well on various types of wireless networks. Once you move it up into the network though, we get into more traditional networking mm -hmm. standards, then the point is interworking not just the protocols, which can happen at a sure. gateway or any point, sure. but interworking the data elements. So this is right. where um, uh, aggregation, uh, applying semantics engines to the data, okay. uh, uh, normalizing the data flows, being able to share data flows even before they get to an application. Right. So it doesn't have to come from the data center. There could be a mid-layer right. that's brokering access to real-time information out of the thermostat. Okay. One of the great comments I saw today is that 60% of the data is stale after just a few milliseconds. So this is really important to real-time applications. Okay, so you helped me because my next question, we did the lower layer, and I'm, mm -hmm. we're going to get to the middle, and we're going to mm -hmm. get to that part. Where does the middleware end and the app begin? So, because, you know, because you mentioned a few things to me mm -hmm. that sound application layer, that, yeah. that sound, and when you take a look at the frameworks that IBM, for example, is proposing with edge analytics, et cetera, right. there's a real question, where does the app begin? Because it's in the edge. I think they, the answer is they're all diffused okay. through, the, through the Internet of Things. Right. 
in a uh, in a world where uh, diffused. Well, I'll explain. Okay. Uh -huh. So if you if you think of of a, a fully um, a fully diffused computational resource set. Okay. Okay, where every thing has spare processing cycles and right. some bandwidth. Right. So like so can the application reside in the closest few thousand of those devices? Right. Do I even need a separate exactly. location sure. for a server? Mm -hmm. um, I think that's an end game topology okay. that we'd be where, where the cloud folds over and becomes diffused throughout the edge network. Sure. This is, I think, something people are, are trying to do. Um, for us, it's more an issue of what is your instantiation model? What is your deployment model? Because it turns out we have now enough computing power, even down in some very basic devices like gateways, sure. like mobile devices, um, uh, certainly enough that we could put it into your washing machine. Your washing machine could be an interworking gateway right. for the other devices in your home. Mm -hmm. And that was not something that was achievable just sure. a couple of years ago. Well, a real useful analogy there is the way our cable television became the hubs of our home right? Right. for so many people. All right, so now let's focus on the middle air. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, tell me what you're working on. Tell me what's sort of in draft. Um, tell me what's already established. So we we started by doing uh, implementations covering some of the um, widely deployed protocols. Okay. In uh, in so we did HTTP, we did CoAP, okay. we did uh, MQTT that comes from Oasis. Okay. We've then added new work items, so we're actively um, building a profile to interwork with the All Scene Alliance. Right. And on their all join uh, protocol, we have uh, discussions ongoing to do exactly the same for the OIC mm -hmm. um, and several other organizations. So those are in interworking into the lower layers and into the middleware. The next thing we will be doing is doing um, application probing interfaces. Mm -hmm to the lateral interfaces, mm -hmm. to people like the uh, Industrial Internet Consortium, so we can interface laterally to the legacy side. Right. And that will be in a potential release two. Mm -hmm. uh, release one was in January, release two would probably be at the end of this year sometime. So when you have this set of tools to talk, so shall we say southbound, to these mm -hmm. different networks, mm -hmm. laterally, east and west, to different instantiations, different uh, system level mm -hmm. deployments, then you look north and you say, well, there are the true applications, but some of the things that could be done in the middle, right. some of the data normalization, those are in fact really applications and you could have done them very close to the network, you could have done them all the way up in the cloud, sure. or you can physically instantiate it in a service node mm -hmm. separate from either one. Okay. I'm uh, compelled to go two directions. One is to step back, but if you don't mind, I want to go deeper. Mm -hmm. um, and I will step back later. Uh, the issue of temporal and spatial data is very important in IoT. Mm -hmm. What are you developing right now that addresses the problem? So for example, an Apple Watch knows where you are. Mm -hmm. My iPhone, my uh, Rip Curl surf watch uh, is, has a very sophisticated, excellent GPS. Um, there is an application that I use frequently that needs to know where I am and what I'm doing, so location and spatially at all times. What are the protocols that are emerging to solve these particular issues? So what we would do is we would say those are networked using a specific, one of the specific protocols that exist in the industry today. We can't always be sure though that the application you want to interface that data source in is the one that came with the watch. What if you wanted to have that be available to a separate standalone app that was doing other things mm -hmm. for your life. Well, and this is where I'm getting because the, I don't want to send this data to the cloud. That's right. So yeah. what, what we say is we can have a service layer mm -hmm. that can normalize the data, okay. give you the, the ability to authorize the exchange of data elements mm -hmm. Mm -hmm from a middle layer right. directly to another different app without it having to go up all the way to be archived in an app sure. or cached in an app right. and then sent by that app to the other app. Right. Because that means a whole bunch of bilateral agreements mm -hmm. between applications, we think that we don't have time for that. Right. We want to normalize that in the sure. middle layer sure. and then allow you to permit, and the example I use all the time is, 
I will probably allow mm -hmm. my medical monitoring system to read the thermostat mm -hmm. to adjust my medicine dose based on ambient temperature. Mm -hmm. I'm highly unlikely to allow my heating system to look at my medical data. Well, so that, it's asymmetrical. Sure, and that goes directly into privacy, security, and ownership. Right. So where are things like private and public key encryption in these? So we have schemes? an entire security working group with, mm -hmm. with industry mm -hmm. experts doing this, and we can't dictate an answer. Remember, we're, mm -hmm. we're working across sure. many uh, um, geographical and geopolitical divisions sure. Sure. with different philosophies on what could and should be implemented. Can you give me an example? Uh, I'll just say that uh, the definition of privacy and security in Europe is far different than it is in the United how, States. How specifically? Please. Well, so um, in, uh, in Europe, uh, individual privacy tends to trump um, um, the openness of access and free speech, you know, which is enshrined in, our, in the American Constitution. The right to privacy is enshrined in the European Constitution. That's sort of the irresistible object immovable. So this is an EU standard. It's not like Denmark just has this gold standard. Mm, these are EU, no. yeah, EU okay. constitutional it's in standards. Brussels. Yeah, so mm -hmm. so um, having access to medical data is something that will be more difficult in the EU than even in the US, although Continue Health Alliance is a member of 1M2M, okay. you know, we understand some mm -hmm. of the restrictions mm -hmm. about providing health data, but it's not a constitutional issue mm -hmm. like it might be in Europe. Okay. So um, now I want to talk about volume. <laughs> Everybody who's listening to us right now is listening to a high volume data stream mm -hmm. video, or they might be listening, I suppose, on, on audio. Where are the problems? and solutions for IoT. This is, this is um, at the core of, of uh, the capabilities that 1MTM has to consider. How do you manage a variety um, of data streams coming from devices, transiting various networks, mm -hmm. um, some of them... Possibly off of a mesh net or an RF network. Where, the where they're sourced from, at some point they come together and they're transited towards a number of destinations. Uh, all the way from um, HD quality surveillance video mm -hmm. that might be in an in a, um, uh, industrial or a commercial location or even in your home, um, down to what I call petatrickles, which is petabytes of data, <laughs> each one a trickle. Okay. okay, so you have millions and millions of devices mm -hmm. all giving just a few bytes. Right. So if you cut the system mm -hmm. and then all those devices sure. try and resync mm -hmm. back home mm -hmm. to their, you need to manage that. That's not going to happen. We've seen this in mobile networks where towers go down mm -hmm. and everybody tries to reattach at sure. the same time and this is chaos. So you can imagine the problems you know, in that, in the Internet of Things, if every device has lost its connection and they say, ah, I found it again now, mm -hmm. I want back right now, yeah. you need to have some tools mm -hmm. to manage the re-registration and uh, sometimes the reprovisioning because you may have to pump provisioning information back down to the device. So these are things that we do in our management abstraction and semantics group, which takes a look at these larger issues. And interestingly, we, we cover two sides of it. Uh, we use things like the OMA, Open Mobile Alliance enablers, mm -hmm. but we also use the Broadband Forum, which is the fixed network uh, capabilities. So we've, we've mixed and matched the capabilities out of both of those worlds, which are used to manage large numbers of discrete endpoints mm -hmm. in things like telephony networks. So extend that concept into the Internet of Things. I work with a lot of developers um, and a lot of startups, um, funded and unfunded. Um, I think one concern that a lot of developers uh, have, software developers, uh, who are working maybe with a new sensor, something like this. I mm -hmm. mean, the total market for this watch is a million people. This is a niche product. Um, and they no, I'll, I'll say the total market is three billion, but that's the total uh -huh. addressable market because very few people were, were two, uh -huh. and that's one per person on the planet, right? You're right. So that's the addressable yeah. market. So anything okay. else is a yeah, subset I'll, of that. Okay, and that's, that's good insight. Um, but once again, back to my poor developer. <laughs> Um, so they're taking this, this thing to market, uh, and they don't want to do anything stupid. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what the resources are 
for beginning to understand how to choose which protocols I'm going to work with, which uh, which choices I'm going to make in SDK, even things, I mean, we heard this great presentation from the founder of Ubuntu this morning. Right. I mean, I immediately went to the website, dug deep, can I use this? Uh, it looked a lot like sort of AWS's Lambda services. I don't know if you're familiar with this, how you can just pop up instances uh, instantaneously and then let them die. The advantage of these dev kits is yeah. that a lot of the work has been done for you sure. in terms of, of writing to um, instantiations from different organizations, whether it be a, a specific protocol uh, group um, or a reference architecture. Um, even one MTM has a group in Europe that's doing an open source implementation of the one MTM server right. topology. So, what I think a lot of these developers don't look at, they're so concerned about my device mm -hmm. and my app, and they think of that as a binary combination mm -hmm. and they forget what can I offer beyond mm -hmm. this direct linkage right. that's going to make it have even more value right. to the user. Mm -hmm. And the then once you say, well I need to connect to more things, I need to integrate more information, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it starts to open up, well, like, then I need to perhaps interwork. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interworking generally is either we sign a bilateral mm -hmm. and I code to you and you code to me, sure. or you interwork through a standard, right. which, is, mm -hmm. which is where the standards come in. Secondly, um, I say, that's great, you know, um, I want to be a wholesaler for that device, mm -hmm, I'll mm -hmm. take a million, by the way, what's your bulk provisioning tool? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What is your software re uh, update? You know, uh, how do you how do you respond to uh, keep alive messages from a million devices, right. and then ultimately for the market, how would you scale six orders of magnitude? Yeah, and most de of the developer community that's so far away from them that they forget to design yes. in the capability mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from day one. They you don't have to do it. I said right, you have right. to design it. Sure there so you know how you're getting there. Okay. So when you are asked that question, uh -huh. you can give yeah. a rational answer. Um, can you list some specific resources, websites, web, web addresses? What's your URL? So www.one.m2m.org. Okay. And do you have a resource center? We, we don't yet. Uh, okay. So we're a pure standards organization. Okay. We, we okay. will have some links, um, I think, when the open source implementation comes alive. Um, and this will come out of, uh, out of Europe uh, towards the end of the year. And that's been announced. Uh, we will have links to that. Got it. We are not um, an, so much of an individual developer play because we're, we're above the right. device to app mm -hmm. food chain. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, people who want to get toolkits to implement in products, whether they be right. gateway right. Or, or service provider server or mm -hmm. cloud instantiations of an app, there will be tools available to say, ah, I can become compatible right. and interwork to one MTM. We'll also do testing and compliance. Um, some of the Asian countries are very forward on this, okay. and I think you'll see um, some testing and compliance requirements coming out of uh, country administrations like Korea. Right. Um, do you have time for one more question? Sure. <laughs> you know, I think, um, once again, uh, as a standard, standards organization, um, I was lucky in that I, I worked at Sun Microsystems in the very early days, in the 80s, and saw mm -hmm. Java evolve. Mm -hmm. Saw a lot of the successes and then mistakes that were made as the Java, as a standard evolved. Mm -hmm. One of the frustration that I think every programmer has <laughs> is component design. Components, even though it is the object-oriented goal, uh, and for that matter, it's the functional programming goal. Now, functional programming is uh, claiming to remedy a lot of these issues. It, we still haven't achieved it. Um, but if you look at I would say a model of recent success, it would be the REST standard built mm -hmm. on HTTP. And this is just my opinion, but I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I, 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 my question, right. 
I think what makes REST successful, and the reason it's still in its virtuous, in the early stages of its virtuous cycle, is that it's stateless. Mm -hmm. And stateless models have fewer side effects. Is this, is this something that you guys are talking about? Yes, explicitly. It's a great benefit in many cases, mm -hmm. but not all. Okay, so so, tell me what you mean by that. So, there are cases where stateful implementations mm -hmm. have some advantages. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, our technical guys in the committees have thought this through, and this is one of the reasons why we do both MQTT mm -hmm. and REST, okay. co-op, mm -hmm. HTTP, you know, this is all in there because you cannot bet on one pony. Right. You know, it's very unsafe to put mm -hmm. all your money on, on the one, mm -hmm. when in fact there are always applications for which the other approach would be better. Mm -hmm. And this, this clearly has um, strong feelings and advocacy on both sure. sides of the equation, but it's not an either or, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's a when and when not. Okay. Okay. You know, and, and so this is one of those choices that you say, well, I, I need to look very closely at exactly what am I trying to do. Sure. And therefore, then choose something that best suits it. And by the way, if I have a complex implementation, I may be choosing several mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I want to optimize for each mm -hmm. sub-application. Sure. And you don't have to do just one flavor. You know, Baskin Robbins doesn't just have <laughs> the best vanilla, you know. Well, yeah, but that's what led to Java's mishaps. I understand. To to everybody all it's the a, time, it's a balance. Missing simple things like closures and. Uh, yeah, so, so what you have is you have to have the, the keep them separate, don't try and merge, you know, out of the famous Dilbert uh, cartoon mm -hmm. where they, uh, they send uh, the guys away to fix the fact that we have 14 protocols and the guy comes back and uh, says, yep, we fixed the 14, now we have 15. You know? <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, this is so true. So we're not trying to invent the next new one that, that converges all of them. Right. We're saying they exist, they each mm -hmm. have a purpose, they okay. have a best fit. Uh -huh. And we need to accept that and be able to bring them together mm -hmm. so that my restful right. environment can talk to my stateful right. environment right. and um, I can mix and match what networking topologies mm -hmm. the radio implementation of the month right. or of your choice, whichever, right. Right. Uh, because there seem to, they will always be the next one. Yes. And, um, this is uh, this is not something that we will ever be in a position to mm -hmm. influence in the market. Mm -hmm. The market drivers are going to be chip costs, uh, mm -hmm. favorite devices, and consumers mm -hmm. in in different market spaces, mm -hmm. and um, the security concerns that may cause large enterprises to favor one over you know a different protocol that may be used in a consumer space. So I think this is a very natural division, different goals, different solution. Got it. Got it. Well, I have to say, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I'd like to do it again sometime. I um, hope we can. And I'd like to thank you very much for taking time to speak with the Silent Intelligence. Thank you. The Silent Intelligence. Learn more at www.thesilentintelligence.com. <laughs>